Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar this evening. We're really thrilled that so many people are joining us. I'm Hilary Nold, one of Her Majesty's inspectors in our southeast region, and I'm joined this evening by my colleague Dan Lamb. Good evening. And Dan, one of Her Majesty's inspectors. And we're delighted to be joined by Lauren Lefebvre, Breck Foundation, and mother of Breck, who we're going to be hearing about this evening. Hello. Also joined by Sarah from the regional support team and by Lillian, consultation and team. And they're looking after the technical effects of this session. So, Ofsted Southeast Region is working with the Breck Foundation as just one of the organisations that promotes online safety because Lauren's a mum in our region here in the Southeast. Her son, Breck, attended one of our schools, and Lauren's other three children continue to be at school in the region. Lauren's story is tragic and powerful, and she's here with us to share her wisdom and her advice with you as parents and as colleagues who work in or with schools. Tonight's webinar is equally for parents and for schools, um, and in fact, I think over half of you who've joined us this evening are participating as parents. So we're grateful to you, Lauren, for being here, both as a mum and as an expert in this field. Thanks for having me. Dan. Technology is a really, really exciting and increasingly prevalent feature of, of schools. As a Her Majesty's Inspector, I'm privileged to go into so many schools to see children uh, learning and sharing ideas through technology. Increasingly, children are coding and making music. And, and as I say, sharing ideas around the world, it's wonderful. But as, uh, as we all know, and the reason that you're logged in to listen to us tonight uh, is we understand that this comes with associated dangers. And as technology becomes increasingly portable and affordable, children are increasingly putting themselves in danger of harm. This is something that Lauren found out in the most tragic way. And she now trains school staff and parents to help keep their children safe. Uh, the following video, which as Hilary mentioned, will possibly have a lag time at the end of it, explains why. My son Breck, from a young age, loved building and making things. I remember Lego was one of his favourite toys. And he always sort of gravitated to other boys who had similar interests. Uh, as he started playing more on the computer and, and gaming with friends, he would meet up with the type of boys that liked to interact in that way. He was invited into a gaming group uh, from friends at school, which felt like a really safe place for me. Shortly after he was in this gaming group, though, I noticed there was a deeper sounding voice amongst them. And when Breck told me it was the guy who ran the server, I started questioning him. I noticed signs uh, that made me think that Breck was being groomed. I could see those characteristics of manipulation and control. Um, his mood sort of would change. He would become a bit more dismissive, almost a bit rude. And Breck was always so chilled and so laid back. He'd get a bit snappy with me. and and almost as if, you know, he didn't think so much of me anymore. And it just happened suddenly, right when he met this predator. Um, he stopped being so open with me. At the beginning, he was lovely communicating about what was happening online, what he was doing, and that changed, and that concerned me. I thought that I fixed the problem, though, when I forbade him from speaking to the predator, but instead it just went underground and became more secretive. I went through a series of um, speaking to different people, you know, teachers, support staff, friends, nurses, um, vicars, librarians, police, uh, people who worked in the city, all sorts, but no one knew what sort of advice to give me. I even thought at the time and would say that I felt Breck was being groomed, and everyone kind of said, well, that all the boys spend a lot of time online. That's normal for children to be talking to strangers online. I forbade Breck uh, from speaking, talking, uh, interacting, gaming with LD after I phoned the police um, because I felt that sure that he wasn't good for my son. In the end, actually, Breck became more normal once I found out, once I was had phoned the police. So his personality once changed again where he went back to acting normally, doing his chores, listening to me, and that's because the predator had said to him, don't let your mom know that we're still friends. Don't say LD says this, LD says that don't talk about me, don't mention me. And so everything became more dangerous because uh, Breck acted normally and I thought the problem was fixed. The stranger was uh, someone 
quite worrisome. Uh, and in the end, I was more right than I would have ever realized because Breck was groomed and trafficked and brutally murdered when he was uh, lured to the predator's flat. from Lauren about how to help support and talk to your child at home. We're then going to look at what schools can do to help and we're going to explain the role of Ofsted and the kind of things inspectors may look at when evaluating how effectively schools are working to keep children safe online. And before we sign off this evening, we'll signpost you to some useful websites that can help school staff and parents find additional useful information. We'll also let you know how we as a group can share ideas and suggestions that have come up this evening. We'd like to move on by looking at how those around children can help protect them from online dangers. Whether you're parents, carers, teachers, or other staff, we all have a role in protecting the children we look after. Dan, and, and Lauren too, can I ask you to identify and explain some of the dangers and talk to us a bit about what this te terminology actually means? Thanks, Hilary. Yeah, we, we've, we've put up some uh, terminology that we find increasingly uh, pops up in our inspection work and discussions with parents. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. The, the first bullet that we have up there is cyberbullying. It's really important to understand that bullying, many schools use the, the term several times on purpose, uh, is, is often peer-to-peer -peer when, it's, when it's online. Sometimes the children will know each other and sometimes they won't. It might be a complete stranger. And it's important, again, to understand that this could be uh, persistent phone calls, it could be abusive text messages, or it could be photo sharing online. Unsafe communities. Again, we find that there's an increasing uh, number of extremist groups or groups of organised criminals that wish to use uh, young people to uh, undertake tasks for them or undertake crimes for them, even if it's just indoctrinating it, it, into, into a certain way of thinking inappropriate content and that be, might be finding or sharing again very often we find this is pornography that is shared amongst children sexting where children and young people share images of themselves without understanding that the image that's shared can then often be shared repeatedly without their permission online predators often disguising themselves and these are people that are involved in the bottom bullet as well that's grooming this is someone under the NSPCC definition, who builds an emotional connection to gain the trust of a young person for sexual abuse or trafficking. Increasingly, we find that scams are used online and that children have unwittingly shared financial information or that people have mined information. It may be dates of birth so that they could clone a profile or clone a picture. And again, one of the biggest things we find in upper primary and secondary school is violent video gaming. Uh, that's gaming that children are, are playing games that are, an eight, are not age appropriate for them. Uh, parents have not noted the PEGI rating, which is the, uh, the rating between 3, 7, 12, 16 and 18 that the children uh, should be very much like we have for, uh, for films and movies at 15 and 18. And again, these games can very often come with chat rooms where children can text with strangers or chat rooms where people can uh, speak to each other and again put children in danger. Is there anything else to add there Lauren? Well I think it's important to recognize um, sort of uh, the difference between bullying and grooming. Um, I think a lot of times when children are being groomed they don't recognize it because it can feel good. Uh, when a child's being bullied it's uncomfortable, it feels bad, it hurts, uh, it may be quite obvious. Uh, with grooming it it's so subtle and gradual. Um, the child can be getting gifts, compliments, offers, uh, attention, and sometimes the child then being groomed won't recognize it at all. And it really is important that, it, that we help our children recognize that this isn't just about them, it's about looking after each other. Because the child being groomed may not recognize it, but it might be obvious to the friends who can see on the outside. Um, it's, uh, it's been thought um, the Chief Constable Simon Bailey had said that he thought there were up to 100,000 offenders in the UK. And when you think of each of those offenders could possibly be grooming hundreds of 
children, it's really important to remember that this is not just isolated incidents. Uh, we believe, I believe, our foundation believes that every child will be contacted online in some way, shape, or form with someone who's trying to do them harm in some way. And they just need to be educated and resilient so they don't fall for these tricks. They don't fall for the lies. They don't fall for people creating fake profiles and trying to befriend them. Um, the recorded offenses with police continue to go up year upon year, as reported by the NSPCC, and this continues to grow. Uh, the other issue is, is, is children actually who are taking indecent images of themselves. So not only will there be predators out there encouraging them to do this sort of thing, but there will be actually children who are just experimenting, uh, enjoying the, their changing bodies, peer pressure, having a laugh. They don't realize that this can be serious if it's shared and it gets in the hands of the wrong person. And so there are up to 57,000 indecent images of children in 2016, but uh, over 72,000 of those were taken by the children themselves just having a laugh or having a, maybe trying to, you know, impress someone in a relationship. So our children actually uh, need to be educated that it's, you know, it's not just someone approaching them, but it's also peer pressure issues. Thank you, Lauren. I'd just like to interrupt a moment by responding to some comments and questions that are coming in. As I said, the video footage tonight is incredibly powerful, and unfortunately, some of you have had trouble accessing it. So I just want to confirm, absolutely, yes, it will be available on YouTube. The whole of the webinar is going to be available on YouTube, and actually, we've got some additional material that we're going to be able to share um, in, in the coming days. So yes, you will all be able to see this again. Thank you, Lauren. I think it's it's frightening. It's frightening that we're not talking about a specific activity that poses a danger. We're talking about multiple and diverse threats that may present themselves very differently. And frankly, it's just no wonder that children and adults are caught out from time to time. Uh, the NSPCC website identifies four key warning signs to look out for. And looking at these, I'd say change is incredibly relevant here. So a change in how much time a young person's online, a change in their temperament or a change in their social behavior. But it's not that straightforward. For as Lauren mentioned earlier in the video clip, a youngster might adapt their observable behavior in order to cover up certain actions or activities. Warning signs can be incredibly difficult to spot. Lauren was just saying about how many people um, maybe how many children um, may be approached in their lifetime. And actually only yesterday I was speaking to a primary head teacher about some work that they've been doing with young children in their school this term. And she was telling me that the children were really clear, children in years two, three and four, they were really, really clear that they would tell if they didn't feel safe, if something happened to them that caused them alarm or anxiety, they knew to tell. But it transpired through the work of the school that actually many of these very young children, children in year three and year four, had been receiving messages and replying to messages and nobody was aware of this. And the reason nobody was aware of this was because the children had felt that their messages were friendly. They hadn't felt any sense of threat. They'd only felt a sense of friendship. And so there was a risk um, that, that was going unnoticed. I think Dan, you you also had a had an experience. I think with one of your children just recently. Yeah, just playing last week with my son. Uh, we were playing a, a, a game on the uh, using a popular TV plug-in system, uh, and he was playing a racing game. He was doing rather well, and as soon as he completed a certain level, the screen and it just so happened may have passed me by. Uh, the screen flashed up to say you've unlocked another level and suddenly he was playing online with a chat facility. Uh, this wasn't something that was uh, clearly noted in the game, and as a parent, I, I wasn't aware of it, but it shows how quickly and easily these things can happen. The, the, the games and certainly the, the, the use of the internet, the different apps that are available do not always make it easy. It's an increasingly challenging uh, element for parents and teachers to identify and tackle. Okay, so vigilance clearly it's important, but on its own, it just isn't enough. Before I ask Lauren to talk to us a bit more about talking to children and developing a positive culture at home, we'd like to take a poll. 
Yeah, so the poll's been launched um, and the question is, how confident, confident are you about talking to your child or pupils about the internet and the dangers it poses? Feel quite confident about talking to our children, Lauren. Do you think there are things that we really need to think about and do? I think it's difficult speaking to our children. We do need to start uh, from a younger age. This needs to start just like with sex ed. We don't teach our children about sex once they're having sex. We want to teach them about it quite early so they understand if they're approached. It's the same with the internet and we need to talk to them about stranger danger, how everyone online is a stranger. That doesn't mean they're bad, it just means that we don't know who they are. Uh, when we talk to them, we need to be relaxed and stay calm. A lot of times when a parent will find something that's worrying, they might have a panic, I've done it myself. Um, I saw on my daughter's phone, she was sent a link and there was some twerking and it freaked me out and I had to remember myself to stay calm. Um, I, my children are now teenagers and I don't feel out of the woods. It's still uh, an ongoing issue to, to monitor what they're doing. Um, make sure you're asking questions about what your children are doing online. You need to be interested uh, and have a go. Ha play with whatever they're on. Use the social media that they're on so you can understand how it works. And just like Dan said, know, you know what happens when you get to different levels know how to set privacy settings on each and every app or game that your child uses, but you need to really enjoy and learn together. It's important that you're there with them. Um, my huge recommendation is to follow the PEGI ratings. Um, so many parents are allowing their children on social media apps for 13 year olds. That means we're actually allowing our children to lie about their age. If the children are lying about the age, what about all these adults that may also be lying about their age. So if we let our eight-year-old or 10-year-old present them as a 13-year-old, even if another 13-year-old is on that app, do we really want our eight and 10-year-olds speaking to 13-year-olds when that's such a, a different developmental level that they're at? So my recommendation is don't follow the peer pressure. Stay uh, within the age ratings. Use it as a rite of passage. Let your child get to the age, just like with driving, just like with voting, just like with everything that we, get to do as an adult, make them wait and, and really appreciate it. It's time for them to play, not to have to be keeping up with all of their likes and their affirmations and their follows on their social media. Make sure you're using age appropriate uh, real life stories. Speak frankly with them about the dangers, you know, using breakfast story and other children's stories um, in an age appropriate way, because that makes it more real and more believable. Um, and don't be afraid to talk about these things. I do remember it was difficult speaking with Breck. Um, at the time when the predator first approached him, I, I felt that he was an older predator and I was trying to say to Breck that I didn't want some older person pushing his sexuality onto Breck before he was ready. But I feel like it was difficult and wish I wish I could go back and just say, listen Breck, I, I don't mind. You know, if you or your friends are gay, that's fine. But what I don't want is some older person or some stranger pushing their sexuality onto you before you're ready. And it was hard to be frank about that. And I think we do need to be quite honest with our children. Uh, know what apps they're on, know what they're using, uh, and, and look at how many friends they have and you know, how many followers, uh, followers they have. Are these real friends or are these friends of friends who they don't really know? I think it's important to just uh, really enjoy spending time with them and create a culture and at your school within your friendship groups uh, where the children actually play together and they don't all feel pressured to go on these social media together before they're the proper age. Brilliant, thank you, Lauren. We've got some questions and some thoughts coming in. Um, you know, Penny's made a good suggestion. She says she talks to her children about her own mistakes online and asks her children for advice and help and support as a way into the conversation. Yeah. Um, we, we've had a question about Peggy ratings and how they work. Dan, could you offer some help with that one? Yeah. It, it, Peggy run very similar to the BBFC, which is the uh, classification system we use for films uh, and media. So Peggy is the Pan-European Games Information Group. Uh, and again, what they do, they, they play every game that is newly released and they give it a rating. So this is uh, given to them to say, what is the age appropriate? Someone uh, in the questions has noted that a lot of parents mistakenly uh, see this almost a bit like a a difficulty level. It's not. 
the age appropriateness of the game and whether it contains, for instance, sex, violence, uh, whether it, ca it contains upsetting images is what they will look at when they're setting that PEGI rating. They are 3, 7, 12, 16 and 18. They are very, very clear ratings. Uh, and the advice would absolutely be, in fact, the law is that children should not be playing those if they are not old enough to. Brilliant. And, and that leads nicely into another question. Perhaps we could ask you, Lauren, what you think. Um, one of the questions that's come in is, of, of what age do we think parents should start to talk to their children about these dangers? As soon as they actually are touching any sort of device. And it's talking about strangers, that, that you can meet strangers online. These are not all bad people, but we don't know who they are. Just like we wouldn't go walk uh, with strangers in the park, we don't hang out with strangers online. We don't know who they are. So I'd say right from reception or whenever they're starting to be online. I recommend parental controls so they're not actually interacting with strangers, but you need to still talk about them uh, before they're actually interacting. Breck was groomed, somebody else asked, Breck was beginning to be groomed when he was 13. And being sort of an intelligent boy, I never thought that he would fall for this sort of thing. So he hadn't had any of these e-safety sort of real life examples uh, taught to him from a young age. He had all the really basic rules of don't give out your name, your age, your address, where you go to school. Those rules are so important for the little A's for primary school. But as they get older in primary school, they are online with strangers. We need to recognize that and we need to adapt the messages so that they recognize that if they speak to a stranger to realize they're not always who they say they are and to never meet up with them without talking to a parent first. Can I just answer another question that's popped up? A couple of people have said uh, that, that there is uh, unfortunately a, a group of people that will modify games online that have a PEGI rating. They're absolutely right and it comes back to exactly the, the kind of anecdote that I mentioned earlier, that it is so important to keep an eye over your child's shoulder to see what they're actually playing. Uh, and, and another parent noting that some applications are, are available online without any kind of restrictions. We're going to be talking about some websites later that will give you some advice on all types of different apps, for instance, messaging apps and social media applications uh, that wouldn't necessarily get a PEGI rating, but we do have an age recommendation for them. So we will be going into that a bit later. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. There are lots of really interesting questions and comments coming in. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to assure you that we will be doing our best to come back to these after the webinar has finished and compiling a, a, a set of questions and answers, um, links to websites and various pieces of information that we've shared between this group of us tonight so that everybody has the benefit of, of hearing other people's advice um, and, and seeing the responses to a really broad range of questions. Thank you so much and, and do keep them coming in. We are going to move on now and think about the role of schools in enabling children and young people to understand the dangers as well as the opportunities offered by the internet. And really our, our great thanks to the Goodwin Academy in East Kent. We visited this school and we asked staff and leaders about the ways they've developed their policies, their procedures and their curriculum to promote e-safety. And we also met a great bunch of youngsters too. Here's a little bit of what they told us. How do you encourage children to uh, talk to staff and to get support when they themselves may have shown unwise behaviour or risky behaviour online? We need to ensure that students are aware that everybody makes mistakes. And what we need to do is work with our students to help them recognise risks and dangers, mm. to support them through any mistakes that they do make online while they're manageable and help them to understand that seeking support early will help them avoid risks becoming bigger, unmanageable, unwieldy and um, help them to understand that there is support available at any stage. Every school will need to have their own individual policies that meet their needs. As a school, we developed a policy in consultation with staff, with our students, with parents and with external agencies to ensure that there was a buy-in from everybody. And it's important that that policy is regularly reviewed 
but not just annually, that it's reviewed in line with any developments in new technology and also alongside learning from mistakes if there's been an incident in school that we need to respond to and have responded to and ensuring that we learn from that incident and take that forward in future planning. How about sharing your name, date of birth? Uh, you shouldn't share any of that. But Why not? Because like strangers could be anyone and mm. the friends of friends could be looking over their shoulder and seeing all that details mm. and they could be jotting it down on like a piece of note or something. You've all, you've all got smart school uniforms on, would you share a picture of that? No, because they could easily find you because mm. you shouldn't put anything with your personal details. So like, always be cautious if your credit card's out on the table when you've took a selfie or mm. something. Or if your name's on your badge mm. from work, because someone could easily find you from that. If you take a picture of yourself or one of your friends in an embarrassing situation, what can be the dangers there? Can you ever take a picture down that you've put on the internet? No, not at all. What can happen to it? So we could screenshot it and send it to other websites. Mm -hmm. We did this uh, thing in year six primary school where we had this pencil case and we pretended mm -hmm. that was a really embarrassing photo mm -hmm. and we, s we passed it around the room and we saw how fast it can get mm -hmm. to one another. That resembled people sharing it to other websites. Mm -hmm. So once you take the original photo down, it's already been spread with other people. So I think it's great that we train all of our staff on everything we possibly can. It's about training all of the adults in that youngster's life, in my view, because we're with them in the day and we have them at break time, lunch time, the lessons, but actually those parents are at home when they're relaxed and when they're in their room and potentially those high risk areas where actually is it appropriate for them to have that laptop with a web webcam in the bedroom? Probably not. But actually, let's use it safely. They need that technology. How can I use it safely? And a lot of our parents talk to us and say, I don't want to block everything, but I'm terrified they're going to get themselves in trouble. So we provide guides for all of the social media apps as and when they come out. And huge thanks to the Goodwin Academy for that. Uh, again, a, a school explaining that not the way to do it, but the way that they chose to do it. And we'll talk a little bit about developing policies and a curriculum later on. As noted in the video, different age groups of pupils will understand really different things. It was heartening to see in the questions that some of our early years colleagues have tuned in tonight to see how right from the start, children in the early years settings and, and nursery and reception age uh, can develop really, really responsible habits. Uh, I'm going to talk about the early years, key stage one and two now, and the information that I'm just about to speak of really is underpinned by the national curriculum, and it, 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 we've developed it straight from that. And that's really in the early years, in key stage one, children need to know how to be respectful of each other online, but they also need to know how to seek help if they're worried. Very often, this will just be going straight to adults. Pupils at this stage should be encouraged to seek, uh, to develop healthy lifestyles and a really healthy attitude to screen time, as we often call it as parents, uh, as the Breck Foundation advise, play virtual but live real. This morning, uh, the Office for National Statistics noted that children in the UK are spending only 16 minutes per day outside playing. Uh, and I think uh, as parents and schools, we need to make sure there's a really healthy balance uh, so that we can ensure that children are using all the available time they can to develop in many ways. Increasingly, as pupils move into key stage two, they'll develop an understanding about their responsibilities when using technology. This includes thinking about how they treat others and an awareness of their digital footprint and that, that will stay online forever. These pupils also need to understand how to maintain confidentiality by not sharing information about themselves or posting pictures pictures of themselves without thinking about the consequences. Very often pupils at this age get their first mobile phone and they'll experiment with technology and may find it fun to take silly or embarrassing photos. Schools need to educate pupils about the consequences of this and importantly these pupils need to understand that they may, as they're supervised less and have their own devices, be subject to unsolicited contact from other internet users. This might be via a chat room, an email, or often through online gaming. And as, as these youngsters move um, from primary to secondary into key stages three and four, you know, many more have their own mobile devices. 
In fact, I think it's a rarity to find a youngster who, who doesn't have one. Yeah. And generally, they've got unrestricted and unfiltered access to the internet. So schools should teach these pupils about the dangers of living their lives online, responsible use of social media, the dangers of bullying and sexting that we've already mentioned, for both for the person targeted, but also the potential consequences for the perpetrator when the activity may well have started as an ill-judged prank. Older pupils still need to have the confidence and know that it's okay to tell and to ask for help without being embarrassed. Pupils need to learn about risk. They need to be questioning and they need to make considered responses. So you know, how can we do this in school? And I'm going to ask Dan to talk to us about this but also ask the school colleagues out there if you've got any top tips to share with colleagues or with parents, or if you can post us a message telling us what's worked particularly well for you, we'd really love to hear about that. And equally, it's also fine to continue posting your questions. So Dan, can you talk to us a little bit about developing a healthy e-safety culture in school? I certainly can. I, th I think the key word in this all is culture. We're an evidence-based organisation and we don't look for a particular way of doing things. What we look for is that a school has developed its policies uh, in consultation with pupils, staff and parents and review them regularly. It's absolutely right to learn from mistakes, to discuss these openly rather than to brush them under the carpet and pretend they didn't happen. Schools that have a really strong e-safety culture they listen to pupils, they listen to parents, they listen to staff, and, and they are agile with their policies to make sure that they're updated to really meet the needs of the pupils. These schools often weave e-safety through the curriculum as well. This uh, Earlier on we talked about the, the computing curriculum and what this includes, but e-safety should rightly come under PSHCE as well. It should come under section sex and relations relationship education, as Lauren mentioned earlier, as well as a whole range of other subjects. Staff, pupils and parents will all need different levels of training. Staff need to be able to identify the signs of grooming, online abuse and, explo and exploitation. Pupils need to know how to keep themselves safe in an age appropriate way, but also how to keep their friends safe. And finally, parents they need to know about the dangers posed to their children. Those parents will typically be involved with the school. It may be through newsletters. It might be through curriculum letters. It may be through evenings. I worked with a school last week that invited parents in and they met with the police to uh, look at their devices and apply appropriate settings to keep their children safer. I won't say safe, safer uh, online. Thank you. Um, before before we um, ask Lauren to say a few words about schools and parents working in partnership, just let's pause. Um, several people have asked about um, PSHCE, Personal Social Health and Citizenship Education. Um, so that's what that stands for. Um, they're basically life lessons. And to me, life lessons are the most important thing we can teach our children. If they get these life lessons right to keep themselves safe, happy, you know, with good well-being, they can then, of course, excel in all of their other core subjects. Yeah, absolutely. A really good suggestion from a colleague there. Summing up, really, what we've said is drip feeding, yeah. online yes. safety all the time, not just during certain lessons. Really, really strong piece of advice from the sector there. Yeah. So, Lauren, have you? Well, I think it's really important that um, schools and parents work together because a lot of times in the work that I do, I sort of see schools get frustrated because no matter what they do, they can't get every parent on board. And we never will because we all parent in different ways. But I think we still need to stay positive and continue to hold really engaging parental workshops, pulling in uh, outside resources. I mean, the Breck Foundation is one of them. We come in and talk about real life stories. There's plenty of other organizations that come in so that parents actually can get uh, an overview in a different way um, and, and not just the, the rules and the do's and don'ts, just like the children. It needs to be engaging and interesting, but also help maybe with um, 
parental meetings with providing childcare, with providing maybe snacks for the children. Make it easy for the parents to come to these meetings. It's very difficult. And, and conversely, parents make the effort. You know, I know a lot of us are not techie. I've seen some, some comments up on the board. I'm not techie, what do I do? We're never going to all catch up with our children. I mean, I wish we could, I wish I could, but we need to actually look at the behaviors and understand more about the technology that they're using. Don't be put off by the fact that you aren't as technologically savvy as them. Just make the efforts to learn more about what they're doing. People that asked about what do we start with in nursery, it's just like uh, uh, talking about stranger danger, talking about what a stranger looks like and how everyone online is a stranger. That's the way to drip feed it in with the, with the younger ones. Someone else asked about, are there safe apps for pupils? Some schools, I've seen it, they actually have apps that they use within your school that it only has pupils on their platforms. And kudos to those schools that get those sorts of apps in because I believe that that would be a really great first place for children to start inter interacting socially online where you know that they're safe because it's monitored by someone who works within the school setting. Um, we need to teach our children that online is just like real life. We don't bully face to face, so we don't bully online. We don't accept gifts from strangers, so we shouldn't accept them online. We don't show our bodies to people on the street, so we shouldn't show them online. I think it's trying to create that culture that, as Dan said, that what we do online should be how we behave as good as good citizens when we're out in public as well. The other key thing is that governors really need to take a key role in this. They actually are there making these policies to keep the children safe uh, while they're at school, as well as you know, so that they can go home and stay safe online. We need them to ensure that these policies are implemented. They need to attend the e-safety assemblies, internet uh, lessons, so that they know what their children are learning within their school. If they take a back seat, we're missing out on sort of that leadership. So we need the whole uh, team effort, really, of parents, governors, all support staff, not just the safeguarding leads, not just the the uh, teachers, it needs to be all support staff who know how to safeguard their children within school uh, about any issue, especially online, something they might overhear, they might be able to report and help a child stay safe. So it's really working together. We're getting some really great suggestions as as well uh, at the moment. Lots of uh, lots of parents talking about how they they share experiences uh, with their children. Um, a foster carer who notes that technology isn't allowed upstairs stairs it's not uh, it's not hidden away in a bedroom uh, pretty much what uh, what leaders at the school said as well it's used downstairs it's shared with parents carers and children alike a, a, a good household policy there uh, so that you know what your children are doing uh, a, a colleague has asked what does a good policy look like there is no such thing as a good policy it's got to be good for your school it won't be good for every school so what i would say is in, it, it, you know do not be tempted to just uh, find a, a model policy i would look at what your school actually needs what the children actually need based on their age their use of technology the parental understanding the pupils understanding and what have been the the strengths and weaknesses in your provision and I would develop a policy from there, a bespoke policy, a bespoke policy that meets the needs uh, of your pupils is by far the best thing. Thank you, Dan. Um, there's a comment here, which is a fair one. Um, I wanted to make a point about stranger danger and sexual abuse of children by a family is, is most frequently by a family member or a friend, not a stranger. I wanted to raise this regarding online and electronic devices also. Um, I don't think we dismiss that point, no. but we're here tonight, you know, really focusing on the dangers um, of online grooming. And we, we do need to educate our children about, about all sorts of abuse yeah. so that they are more resilient and empowered to go to Childline. They need to have this number memorized and explain that they can take it throughout their teens. In, in uh, the case of Rex friends, they all learned about Childline when they were young, but they didn't use this in their teens. We need to make sure they keep that, that number with them, that they know about CEOP, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Command. We need them to be able to report, whether it's a face-to-face -face contact or an online contact, that they feel confident enough that they can go and report that. And, and if, any, if anyone does, uh sort of wish to look into that further there's some very very uh, useful resources on the nspcc website uh, particularly around their pants rule as well 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, again, you know, just so many comments and questions coming in now, but to reassure you, we will provide links to them um, after this event, so you will all have an opportunity to share um, the, the, the tips and the advice that's coming through. We're going to move on now um, and think a little bit more about the role of Ofsted and, and what it is that inspectors do. And of the school staff participating tonight, some of you are likely to have recent experience of an Ofsted inspection. Others of you may have undergone inspection in the past or perhaps not at all. Parents might have been involved through completing parent view or possibly even by meeting with inspectors. What I'd like to stress is that all inspections have regard for safeguarding, no matter what other key themes or lines of inquiry are being considered. And I'd also like to stress that there's not a single uniform way in which inspectors gather and evaluate the evidence, though there will be strong and key similarities. So let's hear from Dan again. And once again, feel free to post a question. Well, we've always inspected safeguarding. Emerging technologies that are increasingly portable, accessible and affordable have now become a normal part of children's lives, both in school and at home. Given this, we've had to evolve our practice as new technology emerges. Ofsted is an evidence-based organisation. We use a range of activities to gather first-hand information about how effectively pupils are protected from harm and increasingly how effectively they are taught to keep themselves safe. So what do we look at? Well, firstly, we talk to leaders, including governors, to gauge their understanding of internet safety and the related dangers such as child sexual exploitation, grooming, radicalisation and extremism, and bullying. We want to know that leaders are training staff to identify and report their concerns. We also check the effectiveness of systems that underpin this work by exploring how leaders check the school is safe. We talk to staff to find out if they're well-trained, supported and vigilant. Do they know what to look out for and are their concerns taken seriously? Do teachers incorporate internet safety in the curriculum? And is this appropriate to the needs of the children that they serve? We gather the views of parents through the Ofsted Parent View Survey and through focused interviews at the start and the end of the school day. We want to find out how safe children feel, how effectively the school keeps their children safe and what this school is doing to keep parents informed of the emerging issues around internet safety. Finally, and most importantly, we speak to young people, those who are all working together to keep safe. We ask if they use the internet responsibly, what they know about staying safe, and what they do or would do when things go wrong. This information is gathered by all inspectors and shared during team meetings or considered as a priority if an inspector is working alone. This informs a key aspect of the school's overall grading as to whether safeguarding is effective or ineffective. Brilliant, thank you. Um, again, you know, just so many comments and questions coming in now, but to reassure you, we will provide links to them um, after this event, so you will all have an opportunity to share um, the, the, the tips and the advice that's coming through. We're going to move on now um, and think a little bit more about the role of Ofsted and, and what it is that inspectors do. And of the school staff participating tonight, some of you are likely to have recent experience of an Ofsted inspection. Others of you may have undergone inspection in the past or perhaps not at all. Parents might have been involved through completing parent view or possibly even by meeting with inspectors. What I'd like to stress is that all inspections have regard for safeguarding, no matter what other key themes or lines of inquiry are being considered. And I'd also like to stress that there's not a single uniform way in which inspectors gather and evaluate the evidence, though there will be strong and key similarities. So let's hear from Dan again. And once again, feel free to post a question. supplement their own curriculum with appropriate external agencies such as local authorities, the police, the NSPCC and charities such as the Breck Foundation. A sharp focus on collaboration between pupils, parents and staff always underpins a, a well-developed safe culture because with technology as we know there just is no break between home and school. We need pupils to make good choices and when dangers arise, 
have them picked up quickly and appropriate help provided. Are there any questions coming through about the, the work of inspectors or inspection for us? I just saw a question actually. Um, there was a, a, quite a few people saying, well, it's really difficult uh, to um, keep technology out of the bedrooms because yeah. they have several children, they all need to do their homework, mm -hmm. and I've, I've had this myself with four children. You can't expect them all to be sitting in one room on the computer. It is difficult. And then another person had the point of, you know, will they go on the bus? Actually, uh, this is true. They go to a Wi-Fi hotspot, a coffee shop, um, you know, to their friend's house. My son, when he was in year four, was shown porn in the park by a friend who had a hand-me-down phone that didn't have any parental restrictions on. And he actually told Big Brother Breck, and Breck came and told me, and that's how I found out. I think there are different age limits that we're talking about. It's much easier to monitor, the, you know, the, taking away their technology at night, making sure they get some great sleep, having a digital sunset, and I sleep right, and I'm screens at night. Um, but as they do get older, those, those do get a bit more tricky, and that's why I think it's so important that that they understand the education behind it, because if we try to just take it away, they are just gonna go off somewhere else and sneak. So all of these things need to be with age age progression. Can I just pick up a couple of questions there, if I may? Um, first of all, a, 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 a colleague in the sector has just asked, how do we check filtering? Well, actually, when I'm inspecting, I check that school leaders and governors are checking filtering. Yep. And I worked with a governing body the other day that were able to tell me that they had come in themselves to check that the filtering systems work. Uh, and that was used to satisfy themselves that children were safe. I've had other schools show me uh, the what they, they, they often call the exception logs, which is when something has been blocked uh, and common things that, that have been that have been blocked uh, when children are using their systems. Uh, and again, more often than not, these are completely innocent. But the fact that leaders and governors know this shows that their systems are working. It's not it's not about Ofsted keeping children safe. It's about those schools having that really healthy safeguarding culture. Uh, another parent, uh, sorry, colleague from the sector has asked, how do we check systems? Well, again, it co goes through those policies. It's looking at whether that is actually used on the ground. Do teachers understand how to identify the dangers posed to children online? Uh, do children know how to keep themselves safe? And then we tend to look, well, we always look at safeguarding systems in, in the child protection files as well. So we will look at evidence of teachers passing on their concerns to the designated safeguarding lead. Every school has to have a designated safeguarding lead. Do teachers pass on their concerns and do those leaders take appropriate action to keep children safe? That's always something that we do during inspection. Thank you, Dan. We've had other interesting comments um, and questions as well. Um, somebody's asking if we're going to be able to put a link to this webinar onto individual schools' websites, and yes, that's something that we're really happy to do. Um, we've had a question about e-safety in the national curriculum. So much of what we've been talking about today um, features as part of um, the computing curriculum, but it is also part of a school's safeguarding duty. The time is pushing on, um, so hopefully um, most of you are going to be able to bear with us if we overrun by five or um, an absolute maximum of, of 10 minutes, um, just as we want to hear from Lauren again uh, about the Breck rules. The Breck Foundation uh, was set up uh, because of Breck's tra tragedy, and I wanted people to learn lessons from that. If I had heard myself speak about Breck's story, uh, I could have done different things. I would have reported it in different places. I would have known what to do. And as hard as I tried, as much as I tried to save him, there were things that I didn't know. And that goes for all the people that I told about the grooming process. A lot of people just didn't know what to do. We created simple safety rules for online using Breck's name. The B stands for be aware. We have been aware, but we need to be more aware. We also need to believe, believe that there are predators out there that do wish to do our children harm. We don't want them to be scared. We just want them to be aware so they can recognize the signs and not fall for, for the control and the manipulation. The R stands for report. Reporting is so important. We need children to be able to uh, know how to report, where to report, as well as the adults. It needs to be a team effort putting these reports in so that we can get a better picture of what's going on in our children's lives. 
The E is educate. Our schools do an amazing job educating our children, but we need the parents to be educated as well, uh, so that both with the parents and the teachers, this uh, knowledge can be cascaded to the children so that they are empowered to make safer choices for themselves online. The C is communicate. Uh, we need our children to talk about these things. Breck did speak to me at the beginning and then it went underground. We need children to talk amongst themselves. Sometimes they will be the ones that will see what's happening online more than the adults will. So the communication is so key not to hold these things in. And the K is very simple. We just want everyone to keep safe. We created the tagline, play virtual, live real. And that's a reminder that whilst we have great time learning and socializing online, we need to keep those friends separate and never meet up with them in a private place when we have only met online. We need to do that safely with a trusted help in a public place and never put ourselves in a position, no matter what age we are, where we can't walk away when we want to. I think a really, really important question for parents, teachers, and hopefully you can communicate this to your children as well to know, is when things do go wrong, when things get scary, how do you report? Who do you report to? Well, I've learned the hard way. Uh, I know so many places to go for help now. And, you know, I did speak to people that I worked with at school, but not everyone was actually well versed in online safety. And that's why I do recommend that governors support staff. Everyone gets this training so that it's not just a safeguarding lead that has to be the one that, that does all that because you never know what someone will overhear on the playground. Uh, but if you do have concerns, go to your school, make an appointment, you know, formally ask them for your help and they will be able to go through channels that can help. Um, as I said, teach your children to use Childline throughout their teams. Um, go on the CEOP website. Uh, with your children, look at the Think You Know videos, look at the NSPCC videos, and show them where they can report. Say, tell me as well, but this is where you can go and report. Have a little practice run. Uh, you know, let them show you what you would, what they would do, and use critical thinking. What would happen if you were Breck's friend? What would you do? What would happen if you were Breck himself? What would you do? You know, run them through different scenarios so that they can think it through for themselves. Um, and also, of course, police. Uh, you know, and, and follow up, go back to the police, ask them what they found out, uh, get follow up reports and don't stop uh, just because someone doesn't listen. You know, just keep asking until you find someone that believes about your your concern, because that actually sometimes this is instinctive. And straight away, I recognized that Breck's predator was a pedophile. I never expected him to be that much worse as, as a murderer. So the instinct was there. A lot of parents will say, well, I'm not sure. You don't have to be sure. Put in the report and all of those pieces of the puzzle can be put together to find the answers. Don't be afraid to, uh, to, to put that report in and see what else can be found out. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, Dan, could we move on and have a, a think about useful resources? Absolutely. Lo lots of parents tonight and lots of uh, school staff have, have asked a, a massive range of questions, be it what, what about this particular website? What do you think about this particular app? How about this brand of mobile phone? What do I do? And, and we cannot answer all those questions tonight. However, we hope to point you in the right direction where you can get these answers. Um, so the resources you should see on screen and we will be sending these out, including a couple of extra links uh, as well in the information sheet that comes with this webinar. Uh, will contain these. The first one to look at is the UK Safer Internet Centre and they contain tips and advice and resources to help children to have a safe and positive time online. They are running into uh, Safer Internet Day. Uh, again, a colleague asked me to mention that earlier and we cannot shout it loud enough. On the 6th of February, they will be running Safer Internet Day where children across the country will be learning about and engaging in activities uh, to help promote online safety, e-safety. The second, quite obviously for this webinar, is the Breck Foundation, uh, run by Lauren. Uh, it provides training for parents, pupils and teachers. Uh, we know, having worked with her for the past few months, that Lauren uh, is up and down the country constantly working in schools yes. with parents, teachers and students, delivering practical, useful advice. Can I just say to follow us on Please. Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter, because we do try to share information so that when a new app comes out or a new you know, a new uh, helpful hint. We want to share that with everyone. And also for Safer Internet Day, we are promoting uh, 
schools and families to have a no tech for break day, to take a day off of technology, to talk about the issues, have an old fashioned play day, get a bit of cyber balance and just really pull together to, to think about um, you know, how we spend our time and how long, how much time we have those devices in our hands. So join us for no teching. Thank you very much. Um, we've also got the NSPCC Share Aware. This is resources for parents and teachers. This is a great website for finding videos and, and ways of explaining to children, this is teachers and parents, uh, some quite tricky topics. Like I mentioned, child sex, sexual exploitation and grooming. It's a difficult subject to speak to particularly young children about and they have videos and resources that put it in a really child appropriate way lots of parents have asked tonight how do i know if this app is right we talked about peggy ratings earlier well netaware which is run by the nspcc is updated daily and it is a one-stop shop to find uh, age of the age appropriateness and the likely content of uh, of any app, website, or game that you can think of. It really, really is a very up-to-date resource and a mine of information for those uh, websites and resources that do not necessarily have an age rating through PEGI. CIOP is the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Command. This is the National Crime Agency, uh, the, a wing of the police. Uh, it is their, their reporting and recording website. Uh, you can find those at CIOP dot police dot uk forward slash safety hyphen center forward slash they run again a, a, a child appropriate age appropriate website that uh, discusses and you know involves games activities and lesson plans uh, for you to use with children and that is called think you know finally uh, just on on this part of the webinar there's Childline. Uh, we, we've all known Childline for years and years and years, but their website is childline.org.uk. It offers information and advice and, of course, a reporting centre as well. Thank you so much. Still so many comments and suggestions coming in. Lots of people are commenting positively on the no tech for break day and are sending really warm messages to Lauren for being uh, yeah, so thank brave. You everyone. I do appreciate it. It makes me pleased. I I can only do this because I know that if I had heard myself speak, that I would have been better, you know, better geared up to help Brack. If I had listened to this webinar, you know, I could have saved him. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, we've had several questions in as well about um, talking to children who have special educational needs about these issues. Um, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to rerun this webinar um, with a specific theme of um, working with children with special educational needs and disabilities so please um, do look out for that we will publicize it um, to schools as we did with this one um, the webinar uh, as we've said with some additional footage is going to be available in the next few days on the Ofsted YouTube page and we're also going to email all of you who've participated this evening um, sharing links with you and as I've said providing a series of questions and answers we've had so many questions what we will probably do is group them into themes and then provide an answer around a theme but we're going to share the tips that you've generously offered um, and, and really spread the word and share the expertise uh, as far as we can we're going to leave the webinar open for questions for the next 10 minutes or so and we're not going to answer any of those now but we will include them in the general question and answer sheet so that if there's something that you really do want to ask please um, take an opportunity to ask it of us now i think really it just falls to me to thank all of you for joining us this evening and to say that you know we really really hope that you have taken something positive from it. In our region, our regional director, Chris Russell, has written to all head teachers and the directors of all children's services to explain our focus on online safety. And our inspectors have received additional training on this aspect of inspection. And this is going to continue to be a priority for us in the region. So please do rest assured that we are paying very very close attention to this incredibly important issue so really i extend my thanks um, to dan for all his work and answering questions and talking to us and working with the goodwin academy 
um, in talking about inspection and the work that schools do. And to Lauren, from all of us, Lauren, from everybody who's joined in online and from those of us who are sitting here in the office, um, our heartfelt thanks to you for sharing a tragedy and turning it into something that will support and help others. Thank you. I'm proud to have been able to work with you, learn more about your work and see how hard, you know, and how much effort you put in. And thanks so much for letting me be a part of this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.